creating cosmos out of chaos. I did want to say, Justin, you have the most beautiful hair. Oh, yes, thank you. Like, <laughs> so golden and... Thank you. I appreciate that. Do you do anything special to it? <laughs> no. Amy made me stop uh, using a bar of soap. That's all I used um, for it's years. Like washing your hair. You yeah, use soap. Yeah, just use soap. Not um, shampoo or... No, just wow. soap, bar of soap, like this, dial, dial soap. This is a magic moment because one of the main comments we get a lot in our world is, Juliana, what do you do with your hair? Oh, uh, yeah. But now you're asking something. Well, I'm like, what do you do? <laughs> it just looks so, like, like natural uh, and, thank and you. healthy. Yeah, I always tell her, sometimes I get too aggressive with it. I told her that when I walked in. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, now, now Amy makes me use her shampoo. That makes me, invites me to use her shampoo and sometimes I even condition. Oh, uh, oh yeah. okay. It's have you, rare, but have sometimes. you felt a difference in the shift? Yeah, she she says there's definitely a difference. Because huh. um, maybe that's just what she wants to see. Because <laughs> because my partner in life often forces me to use shampoo. <laughs> <and> condition. <laughs> well, that's because. No. <laughs> so here we go. Well, Mark sometimes like, well, I washed it. I'm like, how did you wash? It? I jumped in the lake. Like that's not <laughs> washing your hair. That's wetting your hair. Yeah. <laughs> there's a thing called yeah. shampoo. I think it, I think there's a big gray area. Yeah. <laughs> Just between the, the it's wetness. a trend. <laughs> What's the like to stop washing your hair and then you restore the natural skin and eventually you don't have to wash it anymore i mean i've never tried can i be uh, can i be honest with everyone that's watching this yeah. right now i don't know if it's probably been three months since i put shampoo in my hair what yeah i don't tell her that i don't because she go nuts but it, i think yeah i mean i swim every day like when yeah. we're in canada i'm in, in, the, I'm in salt? the ocean in the salt the salt washes yeah. it yeah. and then um i don't know being here I, i've just been Wedding, wedding the hair <laughs> <laughs> but i have noticed it's drying out now because yeah. we came to austin yeah. and i'm not swimming as much and like, well i would have women ask me uh, what i don't know if you have this at the grocery store when you're going to the checkout counter mm -hmm. but i'd have like women sometimes just like touch my hair without even asking first <laughs> and i'm like turning my head and they're like what do you use on your hair <laughs> and uh, it gets happened around amy too and we're just mesmerized by it. like wow they just touched touched my hair without even asking but um you know, I've I've always told them like a bar soap or now the shampoo, but it's just different. I think that women sometimes will be like, "How'd you get your hair so long?" Right. And I'm like, "I've cut it twice." And <laughs> in, in your life, in my life, no. wow. And, and it was when I donated actually three times now. Once I donated 12 inches. Once I donated 10 inches, and then um, the other time was just like a little trim, somewhat recently because I did that kind of undercut thing right. on the side. Ah, um, okay, okay. But anyways, I I'm like, yeah, I don't cut it and I don't heat it. And I don't treat it i don't use all these chemicals right. in it and so it grows fast and like huh you know i always go to my barber or you know at the salon and um she's like we got to trim off two three inches for it to grow longer they always and, say that yeah, yeah and i'm like well that's cutting two or three inches off and you're trying to grow it longer so it doesn't make sense to I, me i say that to yeah. her all the time she's yeah. like you gotta trim the edges i'm like if i want to grow my hair out i'm not gonna trim she's like yeah just, just let it grow <laughs> let it grow let it go let it grow that's long true. hair don't care what do you do when you fight though i like braid it you, you oh you braid it i braid it back like a like a viking style braid oh, so, wow yeah that goes with the incredible beard i guess quite well thank you yeah <laughs> they used to call me the viking in okay. uh, MMA or in the UFC I kind of fight like one uh, take people down and ground and pound is kind of my style to a submission but um, yeah I think for me it's it's actually one of the only rules you know no no eye gouging no fish hooking no groin shots and no pulling of hair huh. so and if they're worried about pulling my hair then I can I can they're, they're leaving themselves open for a, a, a big punch because they're they're grabbed on they're not able to pull their hand back and, um, and that includes beard obviously like no yeah, pulling of beard. Yeah, no beard pulls too. Interesting. But now That's my, so interesting. Yeah, yeah, my nickname shifted now from the Viking to the Big Pygmy. Because when I lived with the Pygmy people in Africa, they named me Efeosa. And so Efeosa means the man that loves us. And I cherish that one. But everyone called me Mabutimangbo. And that means the big pygmy. So wow. that's why. Uh, and then everyone's like, why, why are you named the big pygmy? It's like, oh, it's because these people, I love them. They adopted me as a tribe. They're my second family. Um, and I want to use my nickname as a way to, or social media handle, as wow. a way to like raise awareness for them and their, their plight, their fight. Can, you, can you explain a little bit more about the pygmy? Because this is the sure. first time I've ever, ever heard about, you know, these yeah. people that live right. in, like you're saying, in Africa, right? Yeah, absolutely. We So I didn't know I was going to start a nonprofit. I actually had no plan to go to Africa. If I did, maybe it would have been for a safari of sorts, uh -huh. but 
Um, I was going through a really tough time in my life with addiction and depression. And so I'm a two time suicide survivor and I've been to treatment twice in my life. Um, but at the same time I was competing at the highest level in, in sports, but I was hooked on Oxycontin, uh, being an athlete and having surgeries and being a fighter pain comes with that. And this was at the beginning of the opioid epidemic and they just gave it to you like candy. Wow. I had three different doctors that would give it to me and, uh, they'd give me 60, 90, 120, which now there's no way in the world they would ever give someone 60. Um, so I was going through depression, addiction, and because of that, I actually got f kicked off my fight team, the best fight team in the world. And, and this is um, when you were Yeah, in the, the UFC and champion? fighting. Yeah. Well, I was a national champion in wrestling. I haven't really been a champion in, in uh, MMA, but I've been a high-level pro. F yeah. I'm 15 and 2 professionally. And, uh, but I was just off the Ultimate Fighter TV show, and I was the youngest guy, 21, and started fighting professionally at 19 next youngest guy in the ultimate fighter house was 28 or 29 heavyweights are normally an older man's division and right. so people get in their prime around 32 33 35 but champions will be 42 40 mm -hmm. um wow. and yeah so to get to the story of how i got over there with the pygmies was i i had started small people ask i could never go do that mm -hmm. and i'm like well you don't have to go do that you just have your head on a swivel and look for uh, somewhere to make a difference somewhere that you could add value to someone else's life that can be in your own neighborhood for me it was a, a children's hospital is how i got started was i finally sobered up and i started volunteering at the children's hospital and i went through night school so that i could be, become an official volunteer for the oncology unit mm -hmm. and so i was on like kind of where all the cancer kids are and it, some of them were playing ufc video games and they knew who i was and Aww. so i i mean i would I remember this one time, there was one we called, a, a child we called Princess Warrior. Her name was Kennedy. And uh, I got invited to be there to hold her hand. Her dad stepped out of the room so I could be in there with her mom holding her hand while they put her to sleep. She was getting a complete rib cage, basically uh, built on her because she had bone cancer. Wow. And she was a warrior and now she's cancer free and now she's doing great. But bone cancer is one of the most deadly cancers. And My so, God. and she had not relapse with it, but whatever ha it had happened again. And remissions. so, yeah, remissions. Yeah. And so, yeah, she literally has like a bionic rib cage now. And oh so that's where me getting into philanthropy or humanitarian yeah. work started was just at the children's hospital. So what compelled and, you to start there at the children's hospital? Um, I think that, uh, like well, I got, I got, I got invited to the children's hospital to visit one, uh, young boy and he was a fan, um, from fighting. And he got in a ATV or a four wheeler accident. And when the four wheeler flipped, it literally between a tree, his head got smashed in between a tree and the back of the four wheeler. Okay. And so um, had TBI, they didn't know if he was gonna recover. Um, when he came out of it, um, his dad reached out to one of my friends and saw if I could come visit him. And so I did. And my first experience there, like my first trip in Africa, I thought, what am I doing here? Why did I go? This is maybe meaningless because for, for him, this young boy, he didn't even know I was there. All I, all I heard was him groaning in pain, um, not able to really see anyone that's there. And they're like, just talk to him. And so I'm talking to him, but I left there crying. I left there like, um, you know, not, not just that he's not going to remember me being there. That doesn't matter. But just crying because like he was in so much agony of course um but i kept going back and he started getting better and uh now he does jujitsu and he's competing and wow. uh <laughs> pretty pretty yeah pretty amazing then from there i decided i wanted to stay and um so volunteered there i, I organized a whole trip or visit for ufc guys like rashad evans Brendan schaub uh shane carwin i mean just names Dwayne bang ludwig and some big big names in the sport um and the day before the hospital visit where we're all going to go on mm -hmm. the oncology unit the director of the hospital said no we're canceling this trip um why? or this visit and i was like wait why she goes these people punch people for a living oh, wow. and i was like 
yeah and all these kids know who they are if they know who i am they're they're gonna know who they are and they're she's like wait you fight and i'm like yeah i fight and i'm one of those guys and this is my team and these are some of the best guys in the world and some of them are olympians or former collegiate athletes and mm. it's it's not a bar because she thought it was a barroom brawl or a street fight or this mm. or that or the other I was like, I promise you, this is going to be one of the best visits. I've been here when the Colorado Rockies are here or the Denver Nuggets or the Denver Broncos. Yeah. And I go, this, this is going to be different. Like we recognize all these children as in a fight for their life. And they're more of a fighter than we are. And so she said, yes, finally, I actually had to petition again one more time. Cause she said no. Oh and then afterwards, uh i said chaperone us that was how i finally got her to, to say <laughs> yes chaperone us be with us have <laughs> have other volunteers yeah. yeah and yeah we did it and and those guys had some of those same experiences i remember a world champion kickboxer coming out of a room and just bawling because he's like oh my gosh i have two children this same age you know and it's kind of where it all began but afterwards that woman uh, i haven't shared the story ever on a, uh, on a show or a podcast but but uh uh, I haven't thought about it in a while. She apologized to us and basically said, we weren't one of the best visits, but we were the very best visit she'd ever have. She goes, why? And I was like, I think, and we all kind of popcorn shared and it was kind of, you know, we have a fighter's heart, but we recognize the, the fight that they're in. And we just want to be there, give them some warrior energy and just love them through this, say they can do it, don't quit. Um, wow. And so it was, it was pretty powerful. And she, what was funny was she said her two favorite visits ever. She said some of the athletes that came in, maybe they were required to be there. Maybe mm -hmm. they were in trouble. Maybe it was PR. Uh, and, and some of those athletes were really great. But mm -hmm. she said it was different with, with fighters. She said, who would, who would have thunk that uh, the two best visits were like a, a bikers club and fighters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, bikers and fighters and, were and, the two best visits. And the fighters had to fight to get in. Yeah, we had to fight yeah. to get in. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. So that's where it all started. And actually, because of that visit, I, I shared earlier that I was kicked off that fight team. Mm -hmm. Right. So I sobered up. I started going to just watch training sometimes. And then I said, hey, guys, we have a real opportunity to impact some people. Like, let's do this. So after that visit, where I was kicked off the team voted off like 32 or 33 to one only my head coach thought let's get him into rehab let's get him mm -hmm. some help let's give him a shot he's the youngest guy here he's got a lot of potential it was after that visit that all the guys invited me back on the team wow. and so um i didn't do it for that but it was shortly after that I ended up in africa i was also volunteering at the not just the children's hospital, but the rescue mission in Colorado for the homeless and at risk youth group. Mm -hmm. And I was just trying to figure out like, you know, I was, I, I've been fighting against people, but really I'm supposed to be fighting for people yeah. Yeah. and basically said a prayer one time, God, what do you, what do you want me to do with my life? And I'm not religious really, but spiritual in nature. And then, um, but I hadn't really even prayed and someone, I, I was talking to a friend and I didn't have a lot of direction. Yeah. I sacrificed a year from fighting and I got offered the biggest fight of my life. It would have been in the Satama Super Arena in Tokyo, Japan on New Year's Eve. They get over 100,000 people there. Wow. It was going to be for more money than I've ever been paid. And honestly, it was the best matchup I could have ever had for that. Like, stay standing, that guy wins. But I'm going to take him to the ground and I'm going to win. And wow. so, but something in my spirit or soul said, not yet, you know. Not yet. You turned it down. I turned it down and I didn't know why. And I'm like, what is going on? And uh, this was a foolish move. I thought it was almost my reward for being a year sober mm -hmm. and for mm -hmm. not being in the gym and, and, and volunteering and things. And I'm like, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. My agent was confused. Uh, I turned down speaking engagements, uh, nine paid speaking engagements before I ever did it, saying I'm a fighter, not a speaker. I don't have the ability to do that. So I was turning down like paid gigs. And, you know, it was, it was really hard to, to pay rent and, and different things. Yeah. So that's when he's like, man, you need to pray about this. Just, just ask something. And uh, I said, God, what do you do with my life? And I was all alone. And I've done psychedelics, plenty of them. And mm -hmm. I've had visions. This was not psychedelic induced, drug induced. I'm sober. And all of a sudden I have the most vivid vision of my life. That was a movie in my mind, but it felt like it happened. 
and I was walking in the forest somewhere mm -hmm. and I was clearing out vines and thickets out of the way and I'm continuing to walk and I hear drumming and I continue yeah. to walk and then I hear singing and then I come into a clearing and I see these homes or these huts uh -huh. that are twigs and leaves covered in like big, big leaves. And I meet these people. I don't talk with them, but I see them. And the first guy uh, is coughing. I know that he's sick and you can see his ribs. He's starving and he's sick. And I just knew that they were hungry, thirsty, poor, sick, oppressed. And I knew that I knew they were enslaved, um, that they called someone else master. And I started to weep in this this vision and crying for people I don't know. I don't know who they are, where they are, anything like that. And I cried a little puddle of tears. I don't know if that's a puddle, but think about it, like a cookie size yeah. of, of tears. And when I came out of that vision, I wrote down forgotten at the top. That was the thing that I felt. They felt forgotten. That was their identity, the forgotten people or something mm -hmm. like that. And that I wrote hungry, thirsty, poor, sick, oppressed, enslaved. And then I started to really doubt myself and also think I was crazy. I was trying to think, was that a psychedelic uh, reactivation? Yeah. What, was that a psychotic episode, a break? How um, did the vision come to you? Were you meditating and it came? Or, or? Uh, you know, whenever I decided to pray this prayer, uh -huh. which I grew up in, in, in a Christian school and a church camp that scarred my life. Like one, one says, if you ever get drunk, you go to hell. One says, right. God's going to make you drunk in a spirit. And if you're not, you're demon possessed. So people try to cast demons out of me. Then I went to Catholic school where everyone got drunk together. Oh and, uh, and so, which the Catholic school was the best thing ever. Cause they had wrestling. I had two Olympic gold medalists as my coaches. That's where wow. I found my first outlet, uh, right. which was wrestling and martial arts. Mm -hmm. And that changed my life. Um, and then yeah, I would say that it, for me, martial arts changed my life. But whenever I had this vision, that, that, that probably saved my life. Um, what was the prayer? God, what do you want me to do with my life? That was it. I would say that the, the vision, I honestly, I felt crazy. I thought I'd never tell anyone because it wasn't like induced or like mm -hmm. it, it was the most vivid vision of my life. But then I started to doubt it and doubt myself and think that I'm crazy and, or at least that other people would think mm -hmm. that I'm yeah, crazy. Right. If you shared it. Yeah. And I would have to share it with like, I don't know if I could share it, mm -hmm. who I would share. I started thinking through all my friends and mm -hmm. who I could share this with. And maybe some would be open to it. But the, I, I think at that time, my friend group and, and things would be like, sounds crazy. Right. <laughs> so three days later though, I meet a guy named Caleb. And Caleb shares this incredible story, and I wish I could pull up pictures for you because he lived with the Maasai tribe that hunts lions and uh, or at least protects their livestock from lions. And mm. I'm like, dude, this guy's different. And then he was friends with Bear Grylls and helped him develop like survival training. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, this guy might be the one guy I could tell. <laughs> and but I was scared too. Mm -hmm. And he was sharing a story. Other people want to talk to him. So then I went and got in a car with some friends. And we're about to drive away. Something in my soul said, go tell him, go mm -hmm. tell Caleb. So I go inside, tell Caleb and he's all alone, luckily. And I, I tell him and he's just nodding his head. And then he kind of smiles and I go, what? He goes, I know who they are. And I said, what? He goes, those are the pygmy people, the Mabuti pygmy people in Congo. And I was oh like, oh my God, who? I just got chills. Where? <laughs> yeah. And it was crazy. He goes, I'm supposed to go in three and a half weeks. No. And I'm like, wow. And he goes, but you're going to have to come tell my wife, Jess. And I was like, okay, why? He goes, well, she's pregnant. Um, we have a small child and three days ago, my team of three people that were going with me, they all canceled their trip. The U S state department says no one for any reason go to Congo. Why not? Um, the rebels are taking over the airport. Um, oh, their the people were being right. killed. The pygmy people are literally being the United Nations. that confirmed like 34 counts of cannibalism against the pygmy people that they're being hunted, killed, cooked, eaten because of the belief that if you can do that as a rebel group before war, witchcraft, like you would be invincible in battle bullets would fly right through you. Jesus. Or while I was living wow. there, people would have skulls hanging from their, their, um, their belts or waistline and they drink from them before going into battle. And I was just like, wait, what are we doing? Where are we going? Like, this is crazy. And, uh, 
He's like, come tell Jess because she said we needed a sign for me to still go, that I shouldn't go alone. <laughs> and I'm it's, like, so is, is it crazy? It seems a, crazy, right? No, it, it's, it's perfect. Okay. Thank it's you. crazy, it's beautiful. of course, from it's the yeah. intellectual like, perspective. Wow. But no, it's perfect. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. like, that's divine alignment, yeah. man. That's really. Yeah. So instead of getting in there, my friend's cars, I got in his car <gasps> and uh, wow. went to his house and. Um, told his wife who was pregnant, like probably six, seven months pregnant. And, and this is the first person you told with a vision. First and only person I told. And right after you told him, he you said, went to his going, yeah. yeah, right after." Because you just said, that, like you were, as you were recalling, you were like, "Wait a second, where are we going?" So you were, yeah, like you were all, like you knew. Did you feel it? Um, well, I once we went and talked to Jess. Uh, did I feel it? Yes, something was resonating deep inside mm -hmm. of me, but. There was layers and layers of all of the reasons why I shouldn't do it, or the fear mm -hmm. of what's going to happen. Um, why are we going? You know, questions of like, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so all the practical sides of it, but yeah. something was calling to me. Wow. And we told Jess, she like looked at Caleb and goes, you got to take this guy. <laughs> and then I'm like, wait, do we have to go in three weeks? Could we go like later? <laughs> and uh, my, my passport had actually gotten really wet and the, my picture was peeling off. And I'm like, I got to get a new passport, all sorts right. of stuff. And they both talked to me and basically said things similar in nature to, if you never go, you'll never know. Mm -hmm. And you always wonder mm -hmm. what woulda, coulda, shoulda happened. And he's like, I already have my plane ticket to Uganda. I'm like, how do we even get into Congo? He's mm -hmm. like, I don't know, but we'll find a way. Wow. He goes, we'll find a pilot that's willing to fly us in. So there's no commercial flights or anything going into that. No. Wow. No, not at all. Um, and so we, you have to get a basically like a private plane, a uh, little prop plane. So me, Caleb, and a friend named Colin went. And what what year is this? And this is 2012. 2012. And, and I think, okay, so you, Caleb, and Colin. I think it's 2011, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, been wow. going back and forth the last 11 years. Wow. Yeah. The, I mean, we talk a lot about fear. Like, fear yeah. is a very, um, it's a very conscious thing, I think, that's very Present. apparent in our yeah. culture in this day and age. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah for and, sure. And changing lives and making big decisions and um, doing things as much as even changing careers, which can be so important to some people, yeah. um, is such a heavy lift. Now, here we're talking about in the middle of what sounds like... Um, a civil war. A civil war yeah. of some sort. Yeah, 38 different warring rebel groups. I think that number's grown to like 44, 46. Like you had to face this internal force yeah to decide to follow your vision and, and i actually hadn't turned down i i think i need to edit the story a little because i hadn't turned down the fight yet oh i hadn't turned down the fight the fight was still an offer and i was one. still mm -hmm. yeah and i was still thinking about it i felt like i was supposed to say no mm -hmm. uh -huh. but i wasn't completely sure and i hadn't told my agent absolutely no oh. i go i think not yet not not now um, he's like, man, this is a perfect matchup, man. This is a lot of money, man. This is, yeah. this is your dream fight. Mm -hmm. So you have and, one hand, all yeah. of that. And the other hand, this your mystery, vision. like yeah. spiritual yeah. impulse, yeah. not even impulse, just like driving a vision, yeah. vision yeah. visionary force. Yeah. And I didn't know stuff like this happens. Like right. I knew, and this was again, 2011. So, I mean, exposure for I or ayahuasca in the U S hadn't like exploded mm -hmm. like like it has now and stuff but or, or psychedelics weren't as quote-unquote mainstream or just accepted mm -hmm. um but i knew things like that happened but not not just not just on a normal day where you well, say a simple prayer mm -hmm. of like i mean it's it's not even really a full sentence god or maybe it is but it's less than 10 words yeah. god what do you want to do with my life that's it. That's all. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the words. It was the feeling yeah. in your heart. I was that's hungry. That's what spoke. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was hungry to hear mm -hmm. something because I felt yeah. like if I had to explain it, what I was doing in Colorado was great. Mm -hmm. It filled my soul, but it wasn't a lot of direction. It was like, okay, I'll go do this. Okay, I'll go do that. Okay, I'll go do a polar plunge for the Special Olympics, jump in some water and raise some funds. Mm -hmm. And okay, I'll go do this. And it was... It was anything and everything, but it was kind of shotgunned, mm -hmm. and it wasn't like a, a scope, like zooming in on a target, yeah. saying this is what I'm going to do. And I'm normally like that. I need that. Yeah, yeah I need yeah. to focus. I, I need a I need a date on a calendar circled right. saying this is fight night for me to build into it. Mm -hmm. And so, it, uh, I felt 
a little directionless, almost like um, almost like driftwood yeah, in, yeah. in a river, um, just being taken wherever it goes. And instead, I think I needed to get across the river by like talking about the pygmy is like a bow and arrow, like mm-hmm. being shot across. Like right. that's where I'm going. And so we went. And what was the tipping point? What, how did you psychologically get to the point where you like? Because that's a I, huge yeah one decision. Or the other. Uh, so some things happened to get me there. Um, I just Googled passport on Google Maps. I walk in with my passport and I'm like, this is probably going to take a long time or I'm going to have to expedite it. If it's not easy, I'm not going. <laughs> and I, I walk in and I'm trying to give myself excuses. Of course. Right, yeah. Yeah. Out, right? yeah. And so I walk in and all of a sudden I'm in Denver and... I walk in and it's like going through the airport security, except these guys actually had guns on them and they're real officers and I'm going through the x-ray machine and I'm like, well, what place did I walk into? And I go up to the counter, I give her my passport and she's like, where are you going? I go, I, I'm going to Africa. And she's like, why? And I'm like, there's these people and um, I'm not sure I'm going, but I need the passport in case I can. And she looked at it. She goes, this is really damaged. And she's like, go across the hall, go get a picture and come back to me. I'll have this passport to you in an hour. <laughs> and I was like, what? And she goes, she goes, yeah. And I didn't even ask her to. And it was one of the only places in the U.S. I could print it there. It was like one of three or four places oh in the God. U.S. Like there's one in Houston. There's one in Denver. There's one in a couple other spots, I guess. And. Uh, so literally I just sat there and she came out and my passport was warm when she gave it to me. My God. She goes, I think you're supposed to go on this trip. I she said, like, that, she to said you. that to me. Like a stranger at a passport stranger. office. Yeah. Wow. Like I probably look like a deer in the headlights. Like <laughs> I think I'm supposed to go do this. And uh, she's like, okay, we'll make that happen. But everybody else that was in there, I'm, I think, um, unless they had a reason, had to wait for it. Of course. Um, or, you know, or paid a extra fee. I don't think I paid anything. I, maybe I did, but, uh, it was a long time ago, divine, but man. it was, wild. it was wild. Then I needed, uh, a way to get there financially. It wasn't there. Uh, Caleb told a guy, my story guy goes, I'm going to, Oh, actually a guy donated for the like expenses while we were there mm-hmm. for both of us. But then, uh, I made one little post. I think I'm going to go do this. A guy that I had previously fought mm-hmm. and knocked out sent me a message privately, so didn't comment on it on Facebook or whatever, sent me a message privately and said, me and my wife would like to buy your plane ticket there and back. A guy that I actually, the only guy I've ever talked trash to, I'm not a trash talker, <laughs> he, he, he was talking tons of trash to me. I didn't talk any trash before, um, but he said something and I finally like kind of chirped back and i go he goes why aren't you talking anything you don't think you don't believe in yourself this and that i go i'm saving my talking for tomorrow night while we're in the fight i'm going to talk to you i'm going to tell you everything i'm going to do and i'm going to do it anyways and so it's uh, this probably sounds uh but that's my competitor yeah yeah, yeah. so i did i took him down he was a wrestler he was from nebraska state champion had wrestled in college um but i was a national champion and he was talking terrible about Texas, whatever. And, and also taking like personal blows at me. And so I told him what wrestling moves I was going to take him down with. And I did. And then whenever he's trying the reversals, like there's something called a Peterson roll. I'm like a Peterson roll. Nope. And then I hit him more, you know, whatever. And, but afterwards he thought that was crazy. Um, it's happened a few <laughs> times in, in MMA and he's like, you and me are going to hang out. And so we hung out after the fight, we hugged, we got to know each other. I got to know his wife. Um, and he was introducing me to all his friends and then months, uh, or a year or two later, yeah. he's like, we're, my wife and I are buying your trip to, to Africa. That's, so it wouldn't have been possible without that. Oh That's so and beautiful. So then I go and we take tons of, we, we flew into like Belgium, then like I think Qatar or maybe it was Netherlands and then Qatar, then Kenya, then Rwanda, then Uganda. Oh my and God. And then uh, we had to find a pilot, found a pilot that said he was just kind of basically take us in, we get off and he's out. Wow. And, um, how long did so, it take you guys to actually get there? Like how many days? Days. Um, uh, getting there is not the hardest part because in Kenya, 
people to board or get off the plane and then people get on and then you go to Kigali, uh-huh. uh, Rwanda, and then people get on, people get off, and then you go to Uganda. So it, it didn't take that long, like two or three days. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but still a lot of travel. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, mm-hmm. Then we found the pilot to take us in. We drive um, for, oh, f- first, the landing. Um, we're circling and they're literally clearing our runway with machetes. And while oh. we're, while we're oh. going around, <gasps> Uh, more and more people from the village are coming out and the pilot saying, I think I might have to turn around. I don't have enough gas to just keep circling or fuel to keep circling. Village and, like the pygmy village? Uh, this wasn't the pygmy people. This uh, was their neighbors. Oh, the neighbors. Okay. Um, and actually, it was, it was still about a four to six hour drive from where the deep part of the rainforest wow. is. We were at the beginning of the rainforest. Okay. Have you ever had an experience like... No, yeah. never. So you're literally um, circling I, I, in a dude, plane. I missed... I missed out on camping because my dad's a photographer and he's like creative and uh, my mom's an athlete and anytime I got invited on a hunt or a camping trip, like I had a wrestling tournament (laughs) and or some sort of sporting engagement. So this was like my first time actually real deal camping was in the rainforest. That's an extreme first camping trip. (laughs) Yeah, but I had the right guy with me, Caleb, who's a a survivalist and adventurer and um, and a humanitarian and just salt of the earth. and we slept that night close so you to guys village. landed we landed you landed okay <laughs> some of the first people we met though were living under a, a a tarp bunch of tarps it was probably 20 women and all their children they were rape victims that were kicked out of their community because basically like unclean or, or whatever like when gang rape happens i know this is a really hard topic um sometimes the women need need like specialized surgeries to like make them whole again um where two became one type thing and then to get it back to 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 what it should be um and so it's really hard for them to keep clean and then also husbands in their culture some cultures there's there's over 200 spoken languages there's over 200 tribes wow. so different tribes have different um things but some men get to remarry to a younger woman and don't have to take with that stress i remember one woman had seven children had been married 14 years and she was pushed out of her house the day after she was gang raped by the rebel groups rape is a weapon of war there people bbc has called it bbc and the new york times has called it two different things and i might switch up which one is so they say it's either hell on earth for women or the rape capital of the world where one woman every one minute gets raped there and so all of a sudden i'm seeing that and i'm just like culture shock heartbroken gut-wrenched nauseous from hearing some of their stories um shaking like i'm almost shaking retelling it and um so we slept there we went to an orphanage where all their parents had been killed by the rebel groups or had died of hiv um because they had something basically called the it was a cleanup crew terrible name a lot of the rebel groups aren't even congolese there and now we work a lot in Uganda, but there was a Ugandan or Rwandan rebel group that they had a cleanup crew for called the AIDS brigades. And they would basically be the ones that would purposely infect people oh um, with with HIV. Um, and this still happens. Yeah, it still happens for sure. For sure. A lot. It's and really hard to. Yeah. Yeah. No, no one talks about it. No, like, no one knows it's happening. Like we know about all this other stuff, mm-hmm. um, but we, things like this can be stopped. Um and focused on but but congo uganda those kind of places congo should be the richest country on earth for natural resources for natural resources diamonds coltan uh gold i think i think their gold could cancel all of the u.s debt just their gold um and like trillions of dollars and coltan 85 percent of it comes from the congo 100 percent of that is slave mined and all of uh, all of our smartphones and smart tvs and smart devices have coltan in it i've, I've heard about that yeah. a little bit yeah. and i've seen i've seen the mines i've seen people i've seen 12 year old boys be pulled out of the the mines that had died because of a collapse it's a lot of stuff. children doing a lot of mining. children almost all children and and a lot of times the pygmy people because they're smaller in stature their average height's only four foot six uh, mm. for the men um how how do you i find sometimes the emotional connection to these like tragic and terrible horrific things that we're doing on the planet every minute of every day yeah. that we're not thinking about it it's yeah. still happening and to witness that like the things that we've seen in our life I, they pale in comparison and they've affected yeah. like and it left sure. deep imprints yeah Tracks, how does that yeah. like how, how have how does it how, how does have it, you coped with yeah. that seeing it i think with yeah. your own eyes 
like children, yeah. you know, 12 year olds being mm -hmm. pulled out of mm -hmm. these minds. What happens? PTSD happens. Mm -hmm. I have a doctor named Dr. Daniel Amen um, out of California, who's a 13 time New York Times bestselling author. And thank God he's taking me as a patient because uh, he's mostly writing books now. Um, but you can see PTSD in my brain from like brain scans. He studied more human brains than anyone in human history, over 185,000 people and 60 plus heads of state and NFL players and Muhammad Ali. So he's given me a lot of practice is, but also Amy, she inspires me by the way she lives her life, meditating every morning, yoga, um, and ice baths and cold showers. And, um, but I would say a lot of my coping comes from my work uh, right. with fight for the forgotten, like doing something about it because you're always presented with a choice. Am I going to do something or do nothing? And for me, I have, I have a deep, real connection that came from somewhere yeah. out in the ether that, that, that gave this path to me. And so, um, I, I'll share the kind of conclusion of me getting there oh, yeah, and being please. adopted in is because this goes back to me never being able to doubt. Um, I've had malaria there three times. I lost first time. I lost 33 pounds in five days. Um, I was vomiting red and green, which was blood and bile. All my veins were collapsing. I had knots, three or four knots on each hand. I had two or three in each of my arms. This is from malaria. From malaria yeah. because they were puncturing my, my veins, trying to get into the collapse veins to get IV medication into me. And in that moment, I remember it was like Thanksgiving day of 2014 or 2015. And I lived there for a year at this time. And um, my well drilling team called my mom from a satellite phone. And they said, your mom really wants you to come back. And I was like, I'm, I'm in the, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Like, this is, this is what y'all go through every day. This is what they go through every day. And the reason I could say that, because my mom was wanting to evac me out of there. We had this insurance, to get me back to the U S I'm like one U S doctors don't know how to treat malaria. Mm -hmm. like, it doesn't make sense. I'm going to stay here. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and my mom understands now, but at that time she was like, what are you doing? But I could always look back at the vision. But then this part of the vision, we go four to six hours through the rainforest once we land. Um, or after we stayed one night, we, we go out the next morning, we get on motorcycles, go through the rainforest for another hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours. Then we go across a the river. There's dugout canoes, but they're really more pygmy size, not big pygmy size canoes. <laughs> so there, there's a... Uh, hippos there's crocodiles um and us three were the only ones that knew how to swim and i'm like oh my gosh how do i keep my balance in this thing how do i not flip it because i don't want to get eaten but also like i don't want people to drown so just like a wild scenario we get across the river and we go hiking and about 30 minutes in we get to a really thick part of the rainforest I mean, all of it was the whole time. Mm -hmm. There were actually no real trails. Wow. Uh, there wasn't like a, a, a truck trail or yeah. even a motorcycle trail. It was like, um, it was little bitty footpaths. And wow. um, then we're clearing thickets out of the way and we hear drumming and we keep walking and we hear singing and we keep walking and we come into a clearing. First guy who approached us, you can see his ribs kind of looked kind of like a skeleton with skin on wow. and he was sick. He was coughing. He had tuberculosis. Um, while we were there, they told us how they're hungry. They're thirsty. They're oppressed. They're poor. They're enslaved. Slave masters were coming up to us saying, what are you here doing with my property? I own these people. Um, and like right when I got in there though, it was the vision. I saw it before. I can say that to y'all because y'all are more open-minded, mm -hmm. but I saw no, I this know. before I you, and yeah. I squat down into a full squat, my hands on my face and my elbows on my knees and Caleb and Colin are both grabbing me and I had to take like a full knee because I was just weak in the knees and they're like, this is your vision. This is your vision. I had the vision written down on a piece of paper in my back. They knew it and they're the ones like, this is your vision by the end of it, after a lot of this traumatic stuff, I felt so small and the problem so big mm -hmm. that I was like, what am I supposed to do about this? 
what are what are we supposed to do about this who could do anything about this and the vision i got or like i think visually and the picture i got in my mind was um i could i could work my whole life here and it's like trying to empty the ocean with an eyedropper and what's that going to do mm-hmm. will 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 they even notice will i even notice well it doesn't matter um and i told caleb that and caleb's like dude every one of those drops symbolize like a human heart like a person's life um it matters no matter what it is and i'm like okay i go i need a sign on like one of the last days he's like what are you talking about (laughs) you said it (laughs) out loud like yeah i told him on, on one of the last days because um i'll get to one more story of my second trip but dude i was i was just so overwhelmed i one overwhelmed with love for them mm-hmm. because yeah. they are awesome they are some of the most incredible people to walk this earth how did they what was their first reaction like when you walked through this yeah, yeah, jungle yeah, yeah. like yeah what how did some, they bring you some in? people uh were excited Mm-hmm. Um, some people were cautious mm-hmm. because a lot of times visitors aren't good. Did they know you were coming? Mm-mm. This was a no, surprise. we just surprised, just surprised wow. them. So, so this giant uh, man to them yeah, comes out of yeah. the bushes. So I've been, I've been, I've been uh, <laughs> on my second, third trip. We went even deeper into the rainforest, and people would would scatter, run and hide mm-hmm. behind trees. There's been one time uh, I came in and. I mean, I've been called the vanilla gorilla, vanilla gorilla, and, yeah. and things. And then uh, uh, I walked into one, uh, this was called um, Bana Congo, and I walked into there, and they ran and just scattered. Uh, one person saw us before we got to the village, mm-hmm. and so he like kind of alerted them when we saw people running. They were hiding behind trees. I had arrows. I was the only uh, American or Westerner or white guy. And so... so um, that look different and hairy and uh so they're 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 got arrows drawn spears are out um and i'm saying nafika hapa kuwapinda rafiki yango which basically just means hey i'm only here to love you i'm your friend and uh you're my friend and then uh the person they sent out to meet me was a pregnant woman with a baby already and uh sent her to the kind of the center of the village she approached me very cautiously almost scared looked like she's about to cry but then um she like reached out and i have my arm hair is trimmed right now but normally it's a lot longer than this (laughs) and uh so she like reached out and touched my arm felt my arm hair and i smiled and um anyways the baby actually laughed or the like kind of small child uh and then she started saying some stuff and i didn't know what she was saying but basically like it's he's real he's not a ghost um he does look like half man half lion though (laughs) (laughs) and so um we would laugh about that i'd pull out a frisbee they've never seen anything they've never played catch right never kicked a ball and so being able to throw a frisbee i know how to throw it you know where it looks like it's going way over there so people would run for it and then it would come right back to me (laughs) uh and so there's there's just ways of like icebreakers and yeah eating like they ate, sleeping like they slept but on that first trip i was like caleb i just need one more sign and if i get it and he thought i was crazy but uh if i get it like i'll I'll dedicate my life to this and so on the last one of the last days we're getting ready to head back to the plane because we couldn't miss that like they're coming at this time uh this day and uh yeah can't miss that (laughs) so they the chief pulled us to the side and Caleb and Cullen are with me. And they said, Hey, the chief looks at me and says, we don't have a voice. Can you help us have one? Um, people call us the forest people, but we call ourselves the forgotten. And when he said forgotten, and I have in my bag, a piece of paper that says forgotten at the top of it, that's where the name fight for the forgotten came from and fighting for people and and uh, kind of our vision statements overcoming oppression with overwhelming opportunity you know their needs were land water food i'm like i i, I told caleb I, go, I can't do that but when he said and i said this before he said we don't have a voice i was like if they give me one thing give me a sign one thing i can mm-hmm. do it's like can you give us a voice we don't have one it's like oh, I know Joe Rogan. I, I'm, I'm a fighter. I'm this or that. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, I can tell your story. Like, that's for sure what I can do. And now it's turned into over 3,000 acres of land. Our first goal was 
30 acres of land, right. two water wells. Wow. Now it's 3, 000, over 3,080 water wells. We're getting ready to do a water reservoir. We built 32 homes from huts to homes. Um, we're getting ready to do not just a water reservoir that will serve 5,000 people immediately, up to 20,000 for infrastructure, future planning. But this is in Uganda because it's much safer to build these things. Okay. Um, and I would always go through there and I would live there as well. And um, I built up over two years in the last um, 10 years going back and forth, probably more than that. And then- Over um, two years? Yeah. In time, yeah. like collectively. Yeah. Hey friends, we hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. We just wanted to put a little message inside right here and say if the story that Justin is sharing with all of us affects you in any way in your heart, you can go to www.thekarmaproject.life to support his mission. Every little bit counts. Even if you're just sharing his mission with other people or sharing this podcast, anything and everything helps. As little as $5 changes someone's life completely. And always stay with them so that's what's great is uh where do you uh, sleep i sleep in one of the huts like when i get there they normally help me build a hut and yeah. so we're grabbing sticks where um that that bend and you make these arches and then you go get the these like either elephant ear looking leaves or banana leaves and a palm leaf is normally the door <laughs> and the hut's about uh about four to five feet tall depending on how you build it and then yeah. uh uh the dirt's your bed and the fires your space heater or your blanket kind of thing wow. um my record i let my year my beard grow for a year that i was there and uh my record is pulling five roaches out of my beard in one night <laughs> um it looks like a nest i guess uh, <laughs> but but I, I i'll tell you that's like some of the happiest times i've ever had in my life is because what they do is um you talk about what before we started you, you talk about what you learn on the mats and how you take that in life and me too as a martial artist what i've learned from mm -hmm. the mats a black belt you know lives a life of service mm -hmm. and they know they're a lifelong student and all those things but what i've learned from them is some of the most valuable stuff i've learned you guys are getting to build a, a community with this podcast mm -hmm. you already have um through your teaching and your trainings mm -hmm. but you now you're having these conversations mm -hmm. i'm telling you i love that we're sitting on these because the most I've learned in my entire life was sitting around the campfire. They called that Campfire University is what they, they named it because that's where they took me to school about their culture. Wow. Um, sitting with the elders, their wives, the children. At the very beginning, not even understanding any of the language, but being able to, to, to smile until your cheeks hurt, like hearing <laughs> stories. The three things you cannot take away from the pygmy people are the forest, the fire, and their singing and dancing. Um, the singing and dancing, you don't sing without dancing, you don't dance without singing. So, um, you know, that's been some of my most fun. Like, Amy asked me the other day, this is actually probably three or four days ago. She said, what, What's what been your favorite day? Um, what's been the best day of your life? And I was like, Well, we just celebrated your birthday, and that was awesome. And we had 28 people around, all sharing what they love about you. And I just loved seeing you being loved on and me being able to cue that up. Like, the gift is your presence, and your gift is using your voice like she uses mm -hmm. her voice to bless others and she just looked at me and smiled and said that's so sweet she goes but what's really your best day and uh and i go oh well that was my best day recently and she goes no i want you to really think about it what's when, when was your happiest healthiest mm -hmm. most like fulfilling day i was like oh that's easy um i go it's hard but that's easy was our second water well it was in babofi and um leo may the chief said that the land we got him was actually the land his grandfather used to take him out hunting and so he said this is my grandfather's land and because we have this land back my grandson will be able to say this is my grandfather's land and was his grandfather's land yeah. and so we're we're celebrating that we're they're teaching me new songs and dances but it was the day we got the water well drilled it was so hard because you can't drive a well drilling truck there one anything shiny attracts problems like rebel groups and things they'll right. think it's drilling for gold or they'll think it's drilling for other things they're expensive plus there are no roads mm -hmm. you're not on any real roads right. um so you're going over boulders and the trucks break down and they're, they're garbage after a year or two 
So you have to do manual drilling out in the rainforest, which we, we have all options mm -hmm. available to us now, but at that time you're wrestling the earth. You're using augers, single prong chisels, triple prong chisels, rock breakers and tripods, and you're, you're, you're wrestling with the earth to get 150 feet deep or 60, 80, 90 feet deep so you can secure a safe water source for them. And we'd pick up and we'd move and we'd drill a week here and then it would start collapsing in on itself. And, and it was one of my first rodeos and we, we weren't sure how to do it. We're trying to use every mm -hmm. technique that we know of. Um, but it took like 28 days to get the well there wow. of hard work. And, and whenever you go to sleep at night, you're praying that it doesn't collapse and you put this, this seal in it to, um, this casing pipe to try to make sure it doesn't. Right. But in some areas it was just filling up with this silty clay, like uh, inside of our casing pipe, then we lose the pipe and then we have to pick up and move a football field away. And we were losing hope. We were losing hope, but we just kept going. And then, um, Basically, we drilled a well close to this woman that, that had lost her eyesight, had lost children due to a waterborne disease. And like, see if we can do it right here. And I'm like, man, it didn't work there. It didn't work there. Why would it work here? Well, it did. It did work there. Uh, they were losing their, using their intuition, which was awesome. She's the closest one living to that well um, and with her two children that, that are alive. And uh, that day we decided to have a party. We we're going to celebrate. And uh, they wrote, they wrote Mungu, Mungu Anatupa Maji, which means God gave us water, which I love that because it was like, it's not me doing it. It's yeah. not our well drilling team doing it. It wasn't even them doing it. It's like the source of life and love like gave wow. us water and they called it sweet water. So they went out and they were going hunting, but, but they don't, sometimes they don't get a, a wild game that day. Mm -hmm because there's illegal logging, there's other stuff, they're scared and skittish of, of humans. So anyways, um, they have to go really deep in the forest and we were really deep in the forest. So uh, I made sure we got like a hog uh, that we could slaughter, um, a uh, goat that we could slaughter. And uh, then they brought back a, a diker, a wild antelope basically that we, and they came back like kings. Someone else got honey, uh, which they risked their lives for honey. So they are going, they're going up a hundred foot in a tree wow. with African bees, which are killer bees and their neighbors have no, I, no clue how they can withstand the stings, but they can. And, uh, they, huh. they get the honey out, lower it down in a basket and they come back like heroes because it's wow. a delicacy and a luxury. And that's just genetics that they can withstand the stings. I think so. Or maybe they're just tough or maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe because they're the protectors and the mm -hmm. people of the yeah, forest. Yeah, yeah, like sure. they get that it's a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. Like they come and take some of our honey, but they do this for the forest and mm -hmm. they're the keepers. And I don't, I don't know, but they can literally wow. get stung and they don't die like neighbors will. Wow. Have you been sick ever with them? Oh yeah. And did they help treat? Oh yeah. Your uh, illnesses with? Well, I have socks on, but, and they're long, but I have a scar on my ankle from a scorpion. And uh, oh. there's a scorpion that we think is the one that got me. It's called a death trotter. Oh, <laughs> um, yikes. So, Catchy name. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, got up in the middle of the night to pee in moonlight, basically. And uh -huh. uh, I kicked up some leaves. And when I did, I went pop, pop. I got stung twice on my ankle. And it felt like I got hit with, I don't know, like a, an injection of like lava or something really, really hot, right? Boiling water. And instantly I was like, oh no. And so I called the chief and they just got a team scattered through the forest, ran out, got the different herbs and leaves and roots and fruits and, um, and pounded it up in a mortar and they put it on me. By that time I was already, I had a fever. My teeth were chattering. I didn't have Tylenol. Uh, I did have ibuprofen. So I took some ibuprofen, um, but they put this paste on my ankle that they said would draw out the the venom or the sting, mm -hmm. poison, whatever you call it. And um, I got better, I got wow. better, but I did, uh, uh, it did get infected. And so I had to go to Uganda to see a doctor named Dr. Happy. <laughs> okay. I don't think I've ever shared this, but Dr. Happy made me cry. <laughs> this, uh, this female Ugandan uh, doctor who used these like alligator scissors thing because it was, uh, oh. it was infected, but, but uh, she's like, wow, I'm, glad you survived like some people die from that and wow. Wow. um so anyway she she uh had to rip off the scab and treat it and all that stuff but yeah initially i mean i felt like oh shoot my my heart felt like it was 
fluttering or 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 i could feel it pounding yeah oh my gosh. and uh after that pace like i got i got better and uh just just knew they were with me too yeah yeah so oh but on the happiest day the last thing and then i want you to ask uh we celebrate uh-huh. we eat we feast we're celebrating clean water. They're asking me questions like, are you telling me there's been water under our feet this whole time? <laughs> and and uh, I'm like, yeah, and isn't it cool we got it? And so they show so many songs, so many cultural dances. I'm getting in on them. Uh, we eat so much. People have honey and, and they like just crush it, right? They're eating it. Like it's, <laughs> we're sticky, but we're, we're sticky, we're hot. We're in the hot rainforest. It gets so humid there, you can see your breath. Almost wow. like it's cold, what? but but it's so like 100% humidity. You're breathing out and you see your breath because it's so hot and humid. That's crazy. And normally that's hard for me to sleep. It's hard for me to go to sleep, sweaty, mm-hmm. sticky, yeah. gross. It's all of um, them. And yeah, and but we danced until the sun was basically coming up all night long. Which that's the only time I've done that there. But before the sun started coming up, there was this moment where there's these like kind of fireflies the, we called it tundu it was the hole in the forest so you can only see the sky and i'd have to wait for a satellite to to fly over to get my phone out if i had a problem with well drilling and so the stars are out no cloud in the sky but there's canopy everywhere but it looked like stars were everywhere because there was these fireflies but even on the ground there's these like glow worms and so basically it was like the forest was was coming to life and celebrating with us. Here's the stars, here's the fireflies, fireflies here's the glow worms. We're all dancing, we're hearing the the parrots and the monkeys and wow. it was just epic to where I went back to sleep or went back into my hut and I lay down in the dirt and I'm covered in dirt that's wet that's turning to mud and I'm I all I remember falling asleep that night was my cheeks were hurting I was still smiling and I was out like a light and <laughs> well, I just it was the best feeling in the world it was it was it was victory over death like clean water for them they're standing on a battlefield of giants so yeah. I think of like David and Goliath or something like like this is their giant but mm-hmm. it's it giants there's a one with the name cholera another E coli another right. one typhoid another one uh, you know, uh, intestinal parasites or amoebas or bacterias mm-hmm. that are all in their water. And so I've been to the World Series, the Super Bowl, the NBA Finals. I was just had uh, my friends all three win gold, two win silver, one win, win the bronze medal at the Jiu Jitsu World Championships. I've been to these things, UFC 100, 200. There's not a crowd or a sound in the world that could crowd out or dwarf the sound of like a small village getting clean water for the first time hmm. like it's just epic it's the sound when water comes out and it fills up a bucket or a cup to me that's it's the sound of like a giant hitting the dirt <laughs> and wow. um like yeah like that that's not going to take them out anymore wow. so have that, you ever shared your vision with them oh yeah and what did they say oh yeah i just kind of they it kind of makes sense yeah um, I'm going to go back and share it again. I'll go back in October and I'll, I'll, I'll try to hold on to it more, have it a more in depth conversation. Um, but for them, they have, they have all sorts of ceremonies, uh, which I think we've lost a lot in our culture of like mm-hmm. rites of passage and yeah. from into womanhood or manhood. Um, but yeah, uh, they, they will have a boga there. I've never done that. Uh, mm-hmm. that's the only psychedelic I think I haven't done mm-hmm. uh, that I know of. And, um, yeah, they have like types of like vision quests and they have dances where they'll paint themselves all basically white head to toe and have like either a grass skirt or a mm-hmm. bark cloth skirt on or, or pants. And yeah, I'm trying to think about, I told them that I, I, I do, you remind me of this. I do remember whenever I told them about my suicide attempt, mm-hmm. they did not get it, did not understand it because they said why would anyone ever hurt themselves if you hurt you it hurts us and we need you and they live in community right Mm -hmm. so uh if these twin leaf huts like you only go in there to sleep or to rest in the heat of day or when you're sick but if there's like a a conflict between a 
between spouses or husband mm-hmm. and wife or, or just friends, mm-hmm. the whole village knows about it. Right. Like you can't hide that. And this is a weird one. I don't, I've never shared this, but uh, I remember one time I, I, I was sick mm-hmm. and my stomach was bothering me. And I'd eaten these old fish from the market that we had in these bags and it was hot and they would rehydrate them and make them into like a stew. And I was the one that really got food poisoning from it. And uh, so I'm sick. But anyways, uh, uh, I also had gas. <laughs> and so I just I just couldn't. So I, I let one out. And uh, <laughs> it was terrible I'm sharing this with a big commu- y'all's community. But anyways. <laughs> kids start giggling all around the village and and uh i'm like poli uh poli poli which means basically poli poli means slowly but poli once means sorry mm. so i'm like sorry <laughs> and uh they're giggling laughing then someone else lets one out <laughs> and someone else lets one out and also it's like musical chairs musical farts or whatever uh, yeah farts. dude it was it was awful, awful and awesome at the same time <laughs> because the whole village is laughing oh. but i think that just maybe can exemplify that that you know you can't hide anything there which means you live in true community yeah. right. like here if we have a fight we can go to our house we can distract with our phones we can have our house our fight in our house and no one else knows mm-hmm. about it we can be as mean as we want or manipulative as we want and only one person knows mm-hmm. that and then they have to go explain it to someone else mm-hmm. and then now it's your side versus their side mm-hmm. type thing but whenever you're actually having conflict in a community where another hundred people can hear, or at least a few other here, like they can bring you to the fire mm. and sit around it and say, what's going on? Wow. How can we help? We heard this, we heard that, and we're here for you. That's you know, I've only seen one person kicked out of a village. And, um, and it was because it probably needed to happen. Mm. You know, an alcoholic guy that had had been physical physical with some people um and then this was a time they weren't living on their own land Mm -hmm. they were calling someone master and the guy got drunk again he hit his master's wife and um and they got in a fight and then they had tried to have three or four basically interventions with them Mm -hmm. sat him around the fire this can't continue sit him around the fire this can't continue sit him around the fire this can't continue and then it happened again. And then for the good of the entire community, they had to ask him uh, to leave. Wow. Um, and I really liked that guy. His name was Baiwanja. And, uh, and where does yeah. he go? Like where, if somebody gets kicked out of the community, like where do they go? Well, I, I, I liked him, but then he's, I know he's in prison now there in oh. Congo, which um it's hard you know if you don't make the changes and you're invited to the change Mm -hmm. you're invited to grow you're invited Mm -hmm. to stop right you don't make those changes um it's it's hard for people um so yeah has that kind of transparency and community changed your behavior coming back oh yeah yeah i don't like um i know this is an interview so i'm getting to talk a lot but but I, i don't i don't i enjoy going deep Mm-hmm. beneath the topsoil yeah mm-hmm. like what's what's real yeah and um and so some of the questions of like what do you do it's like well i mean i i can say what i do but i, I want to ask you more like who who are you what is yeah. like like the pygmy people are the best fathers in the world according to anthropologists they're really? also the most oppressed people on earth it's fascinating but as the best fathers quote unquote best father the, the criteria for that is that they hold their children more than 50 percent of the time the men really yes so while i was there like uh amy just saw this picture of me the other day um and it's like three photos side by side or she scrolled through them and i'm holding this this little infant and his uh his father had just put him in my arms and i'm looking at at his father then i'm looking at the baby and then i'm looking down at my shirt because they don't have diapers there so like (laughs) the baby peed all over my shirt um but it was just different because like the the fathers are so involved and also even in comparison to the the neighboring tribes or villages Mm -hmm. like they're just they're just different like they 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 love 
well. They're great husbands. They're great fathers. Like they're great providers. Uh, whenever they, whenever they have the resources to do that. Um, but going out and hunting and all that, like teaching the grandfathers are so active in their children, grandchildren's lives, like teaching them how to make nets mm. and, and create spears. And it's just really, really active. And so I think for me, it's changed a lot because I'll be a lot more transparent in conversations. I'll be a lot more real and I, I'm not real, like, but I want to really be authentic with people and hopefully yeah. that creates a space to where they can be that back mm -hmm. that's um, really beautiful in a society where we're filled with masking ourselves with a perceived identity and yeah. trying to protect you know mm -hmm. there, like there's so much truth that people hold back from out of mm -hmm. fear i find yeah and and to be able to pursue that kind of depth i appreciate um, that so much yeah it's, so, it's, it's something that we've actually talked a lot about like you know, when you go to social events, let's just say, and that, like, I started almost hating going to a lot of social events mm. because I feel like there's this need to be something. They're like, oh, you know, what do you do? What do you do for a living? You know, Everyone's those like, like poking and prodding. Yeah, each other. where it's yeah. like, if I'm going to have and immerse myself in a conversation, like, I want to understand you. Yeah. I want to know in your heart. Like, I, yeah. you know, it's like what you're saying, like having deeper conversations to actually understand the human being that's mm -hmm. inside here, not. Mm -hmm the avatar that we're yeah. playing to be to kind of survive in the society with egos and you know all of those kind yeah. of superficial things it's like i want to understand your soul and it's so beautiful to see that like i mean you got to experience it mm. in such a natural raw way living with these incredible tribes and people like yeah that is so so life-changing I, I mean, I can't even imagine what it would have been like for you to even come mm -hmm. back to yeah. America after an experience like that. Like that was hard. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was much harder to come back home than to go there. Wow, um, like much harder. And, and you just told a crazy story about going there. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, that's yeah, a yeah, huge yeah. No, that's a huge. Oh yeah, statement. yeah. yeah. Like, well, yeah. so my second trip, I my only goal, and I went alone, uh, was I had four goals: live with, listen to, learn from love them mm -hmm. so that way i can't go in there and i saw what i felt from just my first trip and conversations are like people come and they try to do this or that and we feel like a human safari where people just come to take our pictures or right. to put up a sign saying we did this and then it doesn't work it breaks right the average water well <clears throat> needs maintenance in under a year because it's a max load on it every single day mm -hmm. and so the average nonprofit has a 40 percent success rate wow. when you actually look at it and there's over two hundred and thirty thousand broken wells in africa that's billions of wasted charitable dollars wow. um that's because the locals aren't empowered mm -hmm. to do it for themselves they're not equipped with the tools or educated with the knowledge it has to be someone else doing it for them almost putting them on the bench or on the sidelines saying we're we're here to do this for you and so I call it the show up, blow up, blow out technique, um, where you show up and you have a parade and you throw a party and you get your pictures and then you leave. And I think that's more, it's kind of a facade that it's for these people, yeah. but really it's for the people doing the work and then they leave and, and there's no follow through. There's no, there's no follow up. It's the ultimate no, virtue signal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. in a terrible way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, wow. because because it leaves them worse worse off than before. Yeah. Because they feel like they're stripped of dignity. Um, they mm -hmm. can't do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't taught how to do it for themselves, even if they asked. Uh, the people don't have a system set up to where, mm -hmm. hey, this is about training. It's deeper than than the well. It's right. it's community development. It's infrastructure and it's transformational conversations of like, what do you need and listening. Mm -hmm. How, will this work if we do it this way what okay it won't so why why won't it and how can we do it to where it will work mm -hmm. and be self-sustainable or y'all sustaining it mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> my first trip and then i came back or second trip and then i came back um i held a young boy named andy bow he was 12 years old or sorry one and a half years old and <clears throat> he uh he passed away because of dirty water and I was holding his little hand and cupping the back of his head and blood came out of his ears and his mother was sitting across from me and I could count every rib attaching to her sternum. Um, you know, she was sitting there topless uh, um, and 
and she was starving and she's sick and she lost her husband due to waterborne disease she lost her other son due to waterborne disease now she's all alone and she was in shock she was in shock so much that and not just shock but she was so depleted and dehydrated um that i went out and got her some mango some fish some rice and came back and, and brought it to her it wasn't until she had sustenance food and, and 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 juice that she could actually weep once she got food into her she was able to start to weep and cry so um i went to kind of the market and i brought back a shovel and i brought back a a a, 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 a casket and the slave master said it was cheaper to bury them than to keep them alive they were denied hospital treatment not once but twice his mom was told the first time you're too dirty to come in here second time she was told we won't waste our medicine on a pygmy animal first person that said it was a nurse second one to say it was a doctor said the real reason that crushed me and i started asking real questions about how much were the pills that would have cured them it was a dollar okay how much uh, it was too late in the game for the pills so he needed the shot okay well how much was the shot three dollars uh basically of Congolese franc and i'm like okay the shovel i'm holding is six dollars the casket we're going to bury him in it was thirty dollars um and they had brought three and a half dollars of Congolese franc they were enslaved they didn't have money but they begged for it i'm talking about 85 plus people begging for this to come up with three and a half dollars they had a chicken they had um a bag of charcoal and they had firewood and they're still turned away and i was like this isn't about them having the money or not this is really what you guys said it's like we won't waste it on them and so i helped dig the grave i had blisters on my hands from doing that like but but i was there and i'm like what can i do like i at this time second trip i don't know how to drill wells yet yeah it's like well i'm big and i'm strong and so i can at least help dig the grave that's something i can do <clears throat> but coming back you said how uh, that's a big statement how it's harder coming back <clears throat> i came back from that determined that if I'm using the toilet in clean water, if I'm giving my dog every sip of clean water, if I'm watering my lawn with clean water, if X, Y, Z, if I can go to the bars or the restaurants or Starbucks and I can get free water given to me, it's the one drink they don't charge you for, a glass of water. Yeah. It's like, they should have it. This is my man b -Tech. He's like a brother to me. This guy's helped get them new land, drill, plenty of water wells now there's big water tanks yep. solar system water taps going to every single family member what else they what do they need now they need a medical center Santa. school school awesome yeah and uh so we're so grateful for the boho beautiful family and community so grateful for the stars and destruct podcast really thank you for the work um, <laughs> we hope to put it together and we do good things for god yeah. thank you so much yeah so hey please donate today we would really appreciate it yeah we're so grateful for you thank you yeah and so i come back and i'm already thinking this i'm journaling it on my trip back i, I didn't tell people about burying andy bow for well over a month it might have been two months before i even told my mother about it um, just because I didn't know how to like digest it, process yeah, of course. it. Of course. And because whenever I got this story is why I was like, oh, how do I tell anyone this? There was a mission trip that was going to Haiti um, in Atlanta. I landed in Atlanta. Before I go to baggage claim, I stopped by Popeye's Chicken. Um, I like Popeye's. So uh, <laughs> well, I stopped into Popeye's and there's a mother and daughter they have these blue shirts on that look like a Swedish flag almost because they had a yellow cross. It was like Haiti, 2012, 2013, mm -hmm. 2012. And I see them and the daughter, I'm standing behind them. Daughter's trying to get Coke, uh, Coca-Cola. And she's filling it up. Her mom grabs her hand and says, pour that out, get water. You don't need to drink Coca-Cola, which I get, like be healthy, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the daughter's like, she's 13, 14 years old. She goes, mom, they're not going to have coca-cola and or coke in haiti i'm gonna have one soda before we go and 
the mom instantly goes, you're grounded for a week if you take a sip of that. And so, and she takes a sip of it and she goes, you're grounded for two weeks. And then uh, the girl storms out, goes, mom, I hate you and storms out. And I know coming from Congo just now, and I had been to Haiti before, mm-hmm. I'm like, y'all are about to have your worlds rocked. Yeah. Worlds rocked. One, Coke is everywhere, basically. Like you can almost get it in the rainforest <laughs> uh, in Africa. And, but two, like y'all are fighting over sugar water. Someone's being grounded and someone's saying, I hate you to their own mother over a soda, sugar water. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like, and this isn't like to say my experiences, like I'm, I'm better for it or better than someone else. It's mm-hmm. just, it was, it was, it was eye opening. Yeah. It's, it's a reality. It like was, the rest a reality check. That. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it, we find it actually a lot when we've traveled and, you know, nothing in comparison, but to, you know, place, places like Cambodia, like Cambodia yeah. And yeah, like yeah. different pla- islands in Indonesia and things like that. And then you end up back in like a Vancouver airport and yeah. the value structure here. It's not to like, again, like it's not about like they're terrible people or oh, anything yeah, like that, course. but it's just such a difficult integration. Mm. It's just almost like they just don't know. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, it's like power or this or that. It's like, do you guys understand what people are really yeah truly struggling with Mm -hmm. and it's hard for me to rationalize or 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 reconcile in my mind how come the people that literally have the least sometimes have so much more Mm -hmm. joy yeah peace true friendships real relationships and here when we have so much we also feel like we have so little Mm -hmm. and like I don't know that depression's a real thing there. I mean, they get sad, mm-hmm. but they definitely don't think about self-harm. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, here, I've attempted suicide twice, me personally. And I, I lost seven people in 2021. Five by suicide, one uh, by overdose, and one by natural causes. But I was just looking at that, and I was going and sharing a eulogy here, going and sharing a eulogy there. And I'm like, oh, freak like these guys knew my mm-hmm. story and um yeah it's 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 wild but i think talking about um w- one of the differences i i i came back here and you know kids here uh and i'm not saying we're bad they're good I mm-hmm. totally yeah. but uh i just noticed um had someone that had a nephew and it was just mine 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 mm-hmm. and there i was on that same day that we were getting ready to do the well celebration in Babofi. Best day ever. I'm tired because we got up early, we worked hard, Mm -hmm. and I sit down on a a tree, like a log that was falling over, and a kiddo comes back that got done from a full day's wages, or full day labor, and he gets out his wages. It's 10 to 12 peanuts that he had been given. Like and, act literal, literal. Yeah, peanuts. ten or twelve peanuts. Jesus. Sometimes you get paid in a banana for a whole day's labor wow. or a uh, fish, but really the fish is more like a minnow, like a minnow or two. Jesus. And so um, I'm sitting there, and he sits beside me, and he grabs my hand, and he, I look tired, and he, I have like my hand kind of in a fist, not like tightened, but it's closed, and he opens my hand. And I don't know what's in his hands. And he lets out five or six peanuts. Oh my gosh. And he shares half of his day's wages with me, not knowing we were going to have a feast later. But, uh, but I was like, no, 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 no. Honestly, trying to give it back. And basically, I'm saying, no, it's mine is yours. And you're tired. And yeah. like, eat, eat. Wouldn't take no for an answer, right? Like, like please. Like yeah. a joy of giving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A joy of sharing. A joy of like sharing in each other's suffering mm-hmm. that's what they talk about is like you don't suffer alone we're with you like i mean just wow you know anything you have going on they they step in do you think this entire experience that really brought a, a different awakening for you clearly yeah. do you think that was also a path of healing for you because you mentioned, you know, you, you had addiction, you mm-hmm. were depressed, you attempted suicide. All of that was before this experience, right? Yes and no. Yes and no. So yes. And then I came back and I got married and there's nothing against uh, my ex-wife at all. I, she's awesome. Um, but we, 
I really got um, back in the culture here knowing what life could be like mm -hmm. um, and had an injury, had a surgery, got back on pills. You were fighting as well. At I was fighting time. as okay. well, too. So you came back to fight. Came back to fighting so I could fight for them and speak about them. And we'd get thousands of donations, um, you know, fighting for a million people or something and tell them, you know, I've had one of our well drillers in my corner for a fight, you know, wow. and him being able to come to America and we went and watched a movie <laughs> and you would have thought it was crazy for him and thinking about credit cards and giving, <laughs> giving, giving someone, you're walking through the grocery store, you give someone your credit card and they just give it right back to you. You didn't give them anything. I'm like, no, I did. <laughs> and they're like, no, you didn't give them anything. How, how, how does this work? That's you know? <laughs> and uh, so there's been a lot of, a lot of joy, but I would say that when addiction came back because I was free from it for like five or six years. Wow. Mm -hmm. But whenever it came back, it came back with like a vengeance or I didn't know what to do. And I sought out the best coaching in the world for MMA and every style or discipline. Mm -hmm. um, even in the nonprofit world, the people that are helping us start the hospital and school, uh, the people donating $1.5 million of medical equipment as Project Cure, their founder helped me start Fight for the Forgotten. The CEO, his, his uh, son, has been a mentor of mine for, for a decade. Mm -hmm. The founder of Engineers Without Borders, that's uh, coming with me in October. He has 17,000 engineers that work for Engineers Without Borders, and now he stepped out of that role, is still the dean of, uh, of uh, engineering at the University of Colorado. He's coming with me to help spearhead this, make sure everything's a success. Hmm. Um, you know, there's been some some really great things, but I've sought out great coaching. But whenever it came to the biggest fight of my life, which was mental health and addiction, mm -hmm. I never saw anyone. I never talked to anyone. I never had therapy. So I think that finding community mm -hmm. is honestly, they say group therapy is the most helpful thing. Having a one on one in tandem, right? Like right. group therapy with a, a personal therapist or counselor. Mm -hmm. That's and having community like those mm -hmm. three that's the magic i think but i think it took me facing it all feeling it all for magic to happen or a miracle to be born in my own life mm -hmm. because i would say maybe i got i was giving 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 to i went from from only giving to myself fighting for me selfish mm -hmm. taking every drug to then fighting for them and, and giving all these things while building up traumatic experiences and not addressing them right um and so I think now being able to address them, know that all that was for a purpose and I would gladly yeah. do it again yeah. um, and go through a lot more as long as I have these resources and people mm -hmm. and things in place. So, wow. yeah. So, so, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, so you think, um, because you mentioned your traumatic experiences and also PTSD, yeah. right? So from some of the things that you witnessed yeah. in Africa, like which is very traumatic, coming back to America, you think that coping with it is what triggered the addiction to come back because you needed some sort of like mechanism to, to deal with reintegration in this society, but also knowing what you know now? Like, yeah, that's a great question um, and a great thought. I, I think that I built up traumatic experiences and didn't, didn't, wouldn't look at them. I would mm -hmm. just look at, keep going and honestly keep piling them on type mm -hmm. thing. Um, but I think, I think for me personally, well, it was the surgery that really set me back with like oxy again, my drug of choice. What surgery was that? It was a shoulder surgery. Um, my labrum, I have four pins, mm -hmm. uh, four anchors in my shoulder. Mm -hmm. wow. And I'd be completely immobilized for eight full weeks, but I couldn't train again for a year. And so, I mean, I was able to do some PT, but I wasn't able to be back on the mats. And for me, I'm never better than whenever I'm training in martial arts and serving people. So if I can do those things together, yeah. like that's, that's my happy place. Mm -hmm. um, so I got back on the pills and then, um, how to say it? Just that, I think that, that I felt like home for me was with, in Africa wow. like that's home um, until I found Austin I think like that for me that's the only place I would get homesick for really? was there wow. mm -hmm. but here I would feel at home 
if I had a substance in my body, like I would, or at least distracted or numb, mm -hmm. like that was a comfort zone for me for years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to where I didn't have to feel the, the pain or mm -hmm. be depressed, even though I was exacerbating it or whatever you call it, yeah. magnifying it, I would forget about it. So, um, yeah. And then I, and then honestly, I went on a, I went on a two or three year journey with like psychedelics, which I think had given me a lot of good things. Um, but I think a danger zone for me was that I was looking at them as the magic pill or the magic mm -hmm. potion mm -hmm. or the cure. Um, and sometimes it was being advertised and maybe I would build it up even more in my mind. Right. But some people say this one will cure this yeah. or yeah. fix that. And I think it always has to be the deep work afterwards, the integration. Yeah. And so I wasn't doing that. I was chasing experiences mm -hmm. at times. And so it became a danger zone for me where now I just have to be completely sober. Wow. Yeah. So, and now you are. Yeah. And it's been great. It's been great. Like this hospital and school and everything wouldn't be possible. That's, um, well, there's a light in you. There's things. like the second you walked in this room. Yeah. Like yeah, we felt you. the this entire space light up. And it's, it's beautiful. Thanks. And I don't I can't compare it to anything, but I can say it's a very unique uh presence that you that you hold, that you hold in the space you're in. Thank in you. this conversation is like it's 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 sharing that in, in mm -hmm. such a to understand the depth of that is really beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So now and, you're you know, you talk about the fighting for the forgotten. Yeah. So you're back fighting now right yeah like full i'm healing up from a car accident and then uh mm -hmm. i could have had a fight tomorrow <laughs> oh wow um and there's one potentially december 3rd one maybe january 29th uh -huh. um so i'm just healing up i was sitting with one of the ufc matchmakers i've been sitting with um this last weekend we're we're all in talks with where i'm gonna land where i'm gonna end mm -hmm. up um, but Bellator is still an option. I had a contract with them and PFL has a million dollar heavyweight tournament coming out next year. I'm wanting to be where there's the most exposure for the cause. Um, mm -hmm. So I want it to make sense for me, but mm -hmm. I want it to really make sense for the reason I'm coming back. So you truly like you're like the purpose is so interesting. Like you're fighting, but you're fighting for something other than the fight itself. Yes. I would say that if you looked at, history or or those standout underdog stories mm -hmm. of the olympian who was the dark horse no one had him uh, this last weekend my friend john carlo he wasn't even seated at the tournament and i knew our team knew everyone was like he's got the reasons he's gonna win it <laughs> he, he's the guy he is very technically sound he's put in all this work mm -hmm. but he has more reasons than these other guys do so he blew everybody out of the water and ended up winning and no one had their eyes on him hmm. except us our team because we knew him and you see the olympian that i did it for the memory of my mother who died of cancer i did it for uh the inner city where i came from to show these girls it's possible and for me i i don't think there's a moment of truth in fighting which is when that cage door locks uh whether it's on the amateur level or beginning of pros or when you're in the big show for the first time and all the lights are on and millions of people are watching that cage door locks it's a moment of truth it's like um you know some people are hit with anxiety and fear mm -hmm. and then they're almost paralyzed by that and they don't right. perform but for me i i coming back and fighting for them it's given me this mentality of like oh I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. Huh. And uh, so I know that when I look them in the eyes and that I'm going to be drilling more water wells and we're going to be wow. building a maternity ward and there's going to be safer births and safer, like the mother and child mortality rate during labor is going to go down drastically because we're going to have midwives there. We're going to have incubators in case they're premature. Like um, we're going to be treating malaria and waterborne disease, which I've had both of those. I know how important it is. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I'm coming back. And wow, that's uh, such a beautiful intention. Like the fire in your heart. Yeah. It's not the ego. Like when you speak of that, like you think fighting, right? It's it's an ego. Like yeah, mm. I'm the champion. You hold the belt and everything. But that's like that's the glamour of it. Right? That's the glamour that, like, as you speak about it, that's no longer there for you. Like you're truly yeah. fighting for something greater than you. Yeah, growing up, yeah, I got really heavily bullied. 
And so when I was 13, I found MMA. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm going to be one of those guys because these guys don't get bullied. Mm-hmm. And so I went in there with a chip on my shoulder trying to prove I can be one of these guys and not be the laughing stock of the school or the party or whatever. Like maybe I'll get invited to a party instead mm-hmm. of uh, this or that or the other. And so I did have a chip on my shoulder and then it wasn't fulfilling. I would get my hand raised and I would think, is this it? Mm-hmm. Is this all? And it's not like that for every athlete, but mm-hmm. for me it was. I would get my hand raised and be like, that wasn't what I was hoping for. Uh, I did after a national championship, got my hand raised. And I was like, yeah, I did it, you know, for yeah. wrestling. Yeah. Then I got an MMA, got into it early. And then from there, I was like, well, that didn't fulfill me. What will? Maybe drinking or drugs or partying or this or that. And then it was like, win or lose, I had an excuse to use. Right. And, um, and so now I really think I, I probably said it in a different way, but it's, it's the person with the most reasons usually wins. Mm-hmm. And so, and so back then you were winning, yeah. but there was an absence of something. Yeah. Then I was winning to prove something to everybody right. else or prove something to myself. Even from no, like your traumas as a child, like, yeah. you know, the traumas that you took on from being bullied from yeah. you know, a young age, mm-hmm. that was kind of the, the fire for you yeah. at first. And now it's yeah. like uh, ringside, mm-hmm. we're going to have probably B tech our main well driller that taught me how mm-hmm. to drill wells he hasn't been to the u.s yet so we'll have him ringside um it's hard to bring anyone from the the pygmy tribe over they don't have any paperwork they don't have right. a license mm-hmm. they don't they don't have a picture of themselves until we take family portraits laminate it and give it back to them and it's the greatest <laughs> gift you've ever given them oh my god and uh then we'll probably have raiden raiden is a young man uh, who's now doing jujitsu but uh, two years ago, I met him after he was being bullied at school, and he was beat up at the school urinal. They filmed it and put it on uh, social media. Oh. The next day at the bus stop, they filmed it, put it on social media. The next day, I was with him with my friend Rafael Lovato Jr., world champion in fighting, hmm. and we were with him. And then I took him to. I just I posted about it about a month after being friends with him. And his parents wanted to be advocates against bullying. And so we had a little press conference where they forgave the kids that, that did this mm-hmm. to him. Raiden has autism, uh, is on the spectrum. And uh, he um, is deaf in his right ear, so he has a hearing aid. Um, he gained 110 pounds in 11 months, so 10 pounds a month, because of the medications they put him on for childhood diabetes and other things. So he was just targeted. Um, his life has completely changed now through martial arts. Also, there's a big blitz in LA we got to do where SEAL Team with CBS, now Paramount, brought us out there. He was starting scenes. They wrote in a character named Raiden. Uh, We took him to Medieval Times. He got knighted by the Queen, the Squire (laughs) going through it. We went to uh, the Disneyland, went to Disneyland, and then uh, Chewbacca gave us a tour of all of Disneyland. We went to the LA Rams game, and we're standing on the sidelines before and after, and even during the game, one of the players snuck us onto the field. Uh, They're fist bumping them as they're coming off. Uh, What else? I mean, we went surfing. Uh, Kelly Slater and Laird Hamilton were helping out and went surfing for the first time. Uh, This is the first time I've ever seen the beach. He was from Oklahoma. Uh, And uh, he just got loved on by so many people. Mm-hmm. It was absolutely epic. Some of his favorite people on TV came over and we threw a surprise birthday party mm-hmm. for him. The two, two uh, it was something similar to me, like the two Christmas or birthday parties he had the years before, no one showed up. No one showed up. So we made sure his favorite character from Disney was there and loved on him. And so, uh, so Raiden will be there ringside when I fight next. B tech will be there ringside when I fight next. A guy named Chris, who's mm-hmm. gone through addiction that I absolutely love. Um, he'll be there ringside for my next fight. So, um, there's mm-hmm. a lot of reasons. Hi guys. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. Now, if anything that you've heard from Justin's story has touched your heart, I know it has ours. You can join and be part of his mission by going to www.thekarmaproject.life. You can read all about the fight for the forgotten and how you can support and save lives of the Batwa Pygmies. Thank you guys. What does a training look like for you? Like, yeah, I think it takes a lot. 
uh, the team I'm with now mm-hmm. had the most inspiring sports weekend of my life this this last weekend. Um, but those guys, they're young, they're smart, um, but they don't just train smarter, they train harder also, so mm-hmm. they pair it together. Right. They're, they're training seven days a week, twice a day, every day. Um, How many yeah. hours? Uh, from eight to 10 or 11, and then from one to four or five. Wow. So that's amazing. Yeah, every single day. There's no excuses. So um, I'm not there yet. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, five days a week their training Mm -hmm. um so those long training sessions but one of the reasons is because these guys are mostly jujitsu and i'm mma and so we have an mma class that starts at 12 and when we have the mma class they bump their training back to two so when i go in it's from 12 to Mm -hmm. to 4 30 or 5 so if i hit that morning class it's really hard for me to go back it's like basically 8 a.m to Mm -hmm. an hour break all the way to five um So for longevity and me being 35, um, I'm switching it up to where it's five days a week, yeah. two times a day, and then the other days I'm getting in some sort of active recovery, mm-hmm. which is maybe yoga or maybe a walk um, or ice bath and sauna yeah. and things like that. But yeah, boxing, wrestling, jujitsu, kickboxing, uh, strength and conditioning, and putting it all together. Wow. Um, so the average MMA fighter trains about five days a week, two to three times a day. Um, some of them do six days a week. This team does seven. That's incredible. Yeah. That's. And whenever you start to feel tired and you know demotivated, because that happens to all of us. Yeah. Not to me. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> do you? What fuels you? Like to get back up. Uh, I honestly think it's shifting to. Um, I can't do this in in the MMA room as much, Mm -hmm. but I can still, I'm having to find and create my own boundaries and set my own intentions, which is like, I 35 and having had surgeries and different things. Like I can't go to war every single day, multiple times a day. So now I try to find time to play, whether Mm -hmm. that's at strength and conditioning. Um, I'm wanting to start learning acro yoga from, from Aaron. He's put me up in there. Like, two or three different times and I don't get to touch the ground for like 10, 15, 20 minutes. And <laughs> afterwards I feel better than I ever have. Like wow. my back stretched out and mm-hmm. loose and right. feel like I can run through a wall if I wanted to. Right. Um, so, and then also treating some of the training sessions like beforehand telling my partner, um, Hey, you know, this role, I just want to flow. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want to be so hard nosed, like my body needs this mm-hmm. rest. I still want to move. Mm-hmm. I still want to get my lungs mm-hmm. pumping mm-hmm. and my blood flowing. But, but I don't, I, this isn't a round where like you're trying to win. I'm trying to win. And if you want to win, you can win, mm-hmm. but I'm just going to be here. Yeah. And so finding that way to like kind of reconnect with it, just having fun with it again. So really listening so, to the body. Yeah. And like the signals, yeah, the messages. For, for instance, ice baths. Yeah. Because I'm an addict, I can, I can, Take things to the absolute extreme uh the and i used to have a hard time saying that because i'm an addict and identifying with that but i, I i'm starting to know myself more and say oh yeah if, the, if one's good mm-hmm. a thousand's better <laughs> um so when it came to ice baths uh i would i almost every day i missed it this morning because i had that doctor's appointment but almost every day i do three to five minutes in the ice bath mm-hmm. um and I have one at the house. It's a it's a great one. It's really cold. And which, which one is it? Morosco. Oh, Morosco okay. Forge. Jason and Adrian own it and it's the coldest ice bath in the world. Okay. Um that's, and that's serious. you could make the whole thing a four foot block of ice if you wanted to. Wow. And um but it's self cleaning, it's ozone, it's it's really, really good. I got to help my friend Brigham get it and get get one to Joe Rogan and some other people and um, they're nice. Yeah, they're nice. Yeah. I love them. If y'all want to come over and ice bath sometime, you can. And <laughs> love to. <laughs> but I don't but, know if it, in the in the cube of ice, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll get it warmed up a little. So, but I used to have to be set on a timer, and so the records for Morozco Forge, who spent the longest time in there, I've got the record. Oh, um, wow. So. One is better, a thousand is great. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, someone did 15, 
J- uh, Jocko Willink's son did like 19 or 20. Joe Rogan did 20. The owner did like 26. And I was like, cool, I got you guys all beat. <laughs> and so I did 33 minutes and 33 seconds wow. at 33 degrees. Oh my um, God. And honestly, I felt great after it. I went wake surfing in Austin for the first time after that. Um, and I got up every time and i felt great i sat in a warm bath for about five or ten minutes and then i got out went straight to the lake to be outside to Mm -hmm. be in the sun but i still look back at that and i'm like okay that was the one time i did it another time i did it for 12 minutes and i got hypothermia it wasn't in theirs it was in a colorado river this was one of the first times i did it so I think knowing your body, knowing where you're at, uh, mm-hmm. hopefully this making sense. One of the first times I got in an ice bath was a river before the Ultimate Fighter finale. I didn't know a moving river needed to be below 32 to freeze. So there was like six oh, or eight wow. or 10 feet of ice on the side. And then there was like this eddy I could get in behind a boulder. And so I did that. But my dog was trying to get in, um, I guess, to save me. It was a Connie Corso Italian Massive, 165 <laughs> pounds, trying to jump into... Oh my the, the ice water with me so my friend a heavyweight fighter pulled him out he was so obedient snap he'd lay down or sit snap twice he'd lay down he was freaking out and he wasn't listening to us he knew i guess he, his name was knuckles i guess knuckles knew my body was shutting down um i didn't even know he wow. could sense it so they put him back in the car come back out and said okay get out it's been 12 minutes uh, i was trying to go for 10 and whenever he put my car back or dog Mm -hmm. back in the car uh it had been 12. i i'm sitting in a squat in the water and i try to stand up i can't move i'm like frozen almost like i'm trying to stand up i can't Uh, i'm trying to raise my arm out of the water i can't oh my god and so my buddy josh got in the water pulled me out got me into a hot spring about an hour Uh, i stayed in there for about an hour hour and a half my teeth were chattering basically the whole time. Um, so the reason I say that was I can take it to the extremes there, but mm-hmm. then I really dialed it back to where I'm just doing three to five minutes, three yes. to five minutes, three wow. to five minutes, three to five minutes. That's mm-hmm. it. We're two to three. Two mm-hmm. to three is fine. Yeah. Um, where any cold is good cold. Like yeah. it's just good for your body cold if it's shower. a dip, mm-hmm. splash in your face, for cold sure. shower. Mm-hmm. But now I've gotten to a place after that 33 minutes, I've gone to 10, I've gone to 15 again. But really, now I'm just like, why am I attached to a time, a timer? Mm-hmm. Just sit in there and intuitively listen to my body. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes I get in there and it's three full songs. Sometimes I get in there and it's, it's one song and I'm like, I'm good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But now I don't set a timer. I'm just like, I'm in, I dip my head at the beginning. I come back out, uh, like my head out, sit in there for as long as my body wants. And then it's like, that's good. Like dip again and get out. And yeah, so yeah. now just trying to feel the flow of things. Like I want a hard regimented schedule, but I also want to have fun and just yeah. be playing good to my body. Yeah. The yeah. fluidity of that's super important. And I think a lot of people get caught and captured by the ego hmm. and setting those like need to get yeah. this or need to yeah, get yeah, that. Yeah. And you know, that's how injuries can happen. That's yeah. how hyperthermia yeah, can yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah. Like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It even applies to yoga too. Like well, when exactly. you approach the practice of yoga from the egoic side, it's like, oh, you need to make it look this perfect pose or get into that hmm. full split or it's like, no, you don't. And if you're trying to practice from that mentality, you are going to get injured. Because right. yoga is about how it feels on your body. It may look completely ridiculous to someone else from the external side, but you know, if you're feeling and that serves your body the right way, mm-hmm. that's exactly how that posture is supposed to be for you. So right. it's interesting. I think mm-hmm. as soon as I started practicing that way, um, I started getting injured a lot less or pushing mm-hmm. and finding more of the actual the the resonance inside yeah. of what you're looking for, which is like a balance mm-hmm. rather than pushing too far or, you know. And the hardest thing about yoga, I think, is you end up in a studio surrounded by people and you, this mm. comparison kicks in, right? Yeah. Do you find that in in, in the gym oh, yeah. and fighting? Like- yeah. So I found with this new team, New Wave Jiu-Jitsu, they're incredible. But they train harder than anyone, longer than anyone. And uh, I've started to, over this last month or two, having the conversations with everyone. Hey, my training sessions aren't going to look like everyone else's training sessions. Um. 10 years older than most of the guys in here and uh and i whenever i first came in to try to make a good impression and show consistency and everything else 
I was doing everything that they do, right? Mm -hmm. Just to make sure they know I'm I'm in. Yeah. Um, but now it's like, hey, you know, if there's a position, I don't want to necessarily train because sometimes you, they put you in worst case scenario, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you get in mount on someone, which is one of the most dominant positions, then they put you in mount, all that stuff. So I'll do the positions, but then I'm not so attached to saying, oh, I must do this one and all of them, right? Like. If I'm feeling banged up on my neck or my shoulder, I'm like, okay, this position isn't the best for me today. Maybe I'll come back to it tomorrow mm -hmm. or in a week. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm okay with going off the mats, watching, studying, seeing everybody do their thing, as long as I know I'm not cutting myself short. Yeah. And if I'm being smart and listening to my intuition, yeah, that's like, yeah. So I've I've gotten to the place where, you know, they know they know me. I know them now, and. I'm really trying mm -hmm. my best, but I'm not, I'm not trying to get injured either. Yeah. 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 So surrounded by that much, like that, that many champions. Yeah. What do you think is the decisive piece that hmm. separates them from the other teams? Uh, well, for John Carlo, who was the dark horse that we all knew, he's only been on our team for 11 months. He's been training much longer than that. And he had done good. He had competed in the, at a very high level, but he said it wasn't until he came here, was consistent, was surrounded by greatness, that then he started to believe in himself. And some of our belief in him mm -hmm. allowed him to believe in himself even more. And so I would say consistency, belief, also like just an obsession with like studying, like, mm -hmm. and, and not just doing it, but knowing why you do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the team that I'm part of now, it feels every bit as, as high, if not higher than any time I stepped into the Olympic Training Center, like the aura of mm -hmm. it. Like, right, right, no, right. this guy is on top of it. This guy's on top of it. Like the way they treat their diet, the way they protect their sleep, the way that they, um, well, I introduced Gordon to his first ice bath. Uh, well, um, then he did another ice bath. And then he's like, you know what? I'm going to get one of those. So he got one of those. So now the team's either coming to my house or his house so that we can do <laughs> ice baths. Amazing. And the plan is now we're going to get an ice bath and yeah. a sauna at, at, uh, up there for all the guys of the uh, for the team at the mm -hmm. training center. And so it's just like when something works and it's a benefit, like yeah. everyone's open. It's like open sourced. Mm -hmm. you right. can, you know, this is what works for me. I think it'll work for you. And then yeah. take it or leave it. There's a beautiful thing about life in that, mm -hmm. not just for finding greatness and, and winningness in that which you're, you know, as a team collectively looking for. But I think what's fascinating about things like conversations like this is being in and in life in general, like seeing things that work for other people, mm -hmm. trying them on yourself, yeah. yep. seeing and attuning and it and mm -hmm. does that work for me does that not and then finding your individual path to your own personal greatness yeah mm -hmm. through that journey and surrounding yourself with those type of people like the well, winners yeah. right you are who you, you surround yourself with so if you are around these champions and these people that take their nutrition and their sleep and all of these small details so seriously like that becomes part of your habitual way of living yeah. and that impacts it's the way like you, a collective you growth exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. i'm really grateful for y'all yeah. yeah no and likewise man it's been amazing justin thank you mm. thank Thanks. you for for sharing your heart and yeah. you're like i think it'll take me a while to process all of these incredible stories mm -hmm. that you shared today and just not just the idea of everything you've experienced but also the story of how it brought you there that that intuition that you mm. felt and that vision and that connection that you experienced was something divine that guided you to this. So mm. it's, it's the, stories like that, that you're like, it really like just solidifies this beautiful belief in our hearts for that. We're all guided in a beautiful way. So, and, and it's a yeah, message, a beautiful you. message yeah. to anyone listening. Mm. If you feel that, you know, yeah, to listen, to, to that. listen, mm. to listen to the voice inside, whether it's a small intuition or whether it's a literal vision, yeah. like we are guided yeah. and, and and we all have a purpose and if we f seek it it will reveal itself i truly yeah. believe that and and you're the perfect example you, oh of God. the whole story you. everything you've been through is, is yeah. incredibly inspiring and you know i would love for you to just if you could mention it right now how can 
everyone listening and watching help all of these incredible causes that you're doing how can yeah. they add their Thank drops you. of water yeah yeah thanks. Right? wow yes uh if you want to help us we have right now our carry the water campaign that's found at fightfortheforgotten.org mm -hmm. and that is with a hundred thousand dollar matching gift so wow. that means up to a hundred thousand dollars will be matched or doubled so we need that for the water reservoir to exist it's mm -hmm. a, about a two hundred thousand dollar project but we'll uh, immediately and that's a the biggest water project we've done normally water wells are five thousand ten thousand mm -hmm. maybe twenty thousand but this is going to serve a lot more and it's the infrastructure to build the hospital and the school and a yeah. community hub yeah. and we have partnerships being created or already solidified with people like duke and yale and university of nebraska medical and mm. university of colorado and university of new mexico their engineering departments and medical departments and so when you say that being guided and like i wasn't able to doubt my purpose being there when I had malaria or because of the vision mm -hmm. but what's unique about the times recently and I've never shared this um, is since COVID and since inflation and since the state of the world like we were on we we had had our best year ever you know we had 10,000 donors from all 50 states and 60 different countries like this was a movement but there's been a lot of of either fear or or valid reasons that they people can't support so we've we've shifted mm -hmm. our model from trying to get bigger donors to and one-time donors to an invitation to join a tribe our fight club and basically it's of monthly donors of like five dollars a month or more mm -hmm. and if we can build an army or a tribe of of supporters a movement um given five, 10, 15, whatever they can a month, mm -hmm. like that will let us budget and scale and grow to say, this is when the maternity wards opened. Yeah. This is when the school has its, you know, first, uh, first class. Um, and this is when the reservoir will be completed. Yeah. And so we go in October. I'm really excited about that. And you're yeah. going back. Yeah, I'm going back. Wow. It's for like how around the corner. Yeah. That's for how long? Think. Yeah. <laughs> How yeah, long are you gonna uh, stay? and I'm going with the best guy in the business that uh -huh. also has engineers without borders, Uganda. That's helping to spearhead this. Uh -huh. What's really cool about the hospital and the school is that the local, state, and national government has said they're the ones supporting it. So we build it, mm -hmm. uh, we outfit it, and they'll staff it. Wow. And so it's not dependent on Fight for the Forgotten or Project Cure mm -hmm. or Engineers Without Borders. Mm -hmm. We're the support system to help them. We're, we're connecting the dots with yeah. the resources. Mm -hmm. And then they're the ones. And then we'll have continued trainings. We have a technology center we're building Beautiful. at that community hub where they can do better practices and best practice or better procedures um, at the hospital. So that's yeah. beautiful. So, I mean, yeah. and you have our. 100% support mm -hmm. for all of these causes. It's beautiful. And oh my God. anything we can do, it's very inspiring. Yeah. So Thank you so much. Of course. So Thank it's you. It's going to happen. It is. It will happen. I love that. The affirmation, man. We yeah. have, it, it we have that piece of paper already, right? Yeah, right yeah. there. You're gonna see I have a feeling it's just in your vision at all times. You don't even need to write it down anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, That's going to happen. Amazing. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you, Justin. Yeah, thank you, man. Thank you. It's been amazing. Appreciate it. To connect with you. Yeah. Oh, last thing is... Uh, uh, people if they want to follow it's uh -huh. the big pygmy on yeah. instagram i also have a podcast called overcome with justin wren and so uh i'd love to have you all on there yes and, can't wait uh, we can't wait to be yeah. on it it'll be an honor thank yes. you for sure yeah. my goodness thank you yeah. hello my friends i have a really important announcement to make it took us a little bit of time because we were really looking for the right energy and for the right people but the karma project is here and it is live I met my second family here in the Congo, the Mabuti Pygmies. Uh, they call themselves the Forgotten People. Their slave masters come up to me and say, what are you here doing with my animals? It's so hard for us to realize that some people on the planet right now, 2023, don't have clean drinking water and basic infrastructure to survive. But this is a real problem and there are real solutions. We just have to look into our hearts, you and me, and realize that even as one person, we may not solve the whole problem, but we can make a difference. Congo is, uh, is one of the regions in Africa which has a lot of fresh water, but people are dying from waterborne diseases. 
consider the simplicity of $5. Now to you, it could just be a morning cup of coffee, but to the Batwa pygmies of Western Uganda, it literally can be the difference between life and death. It's worth everything to, to struggle, to grit, to fight. We have to fight. Please break away from the noise just for a second. Together with us, we can open up our hearts if we click the link www.thekarmaproject.life and recognize that we can make a difference. If somebody just got to be here and experience what I'm getting to experience, yeah, it's crazy, yeah, it's hard. Your donation of any size matters because you matter to these people and to the kind of world we all deserve to live in together. I would love to say thank you. You're not just giving clean water to people, but for me, for my Pygmy family, like you're literally helping free people. Fighting in a cage under a ton of lights and getting my hand raised, that was, that was cool, but it wasn't great. I was fighting against people, but really I was just supposed to be fighting for people. www.thekarmaproject.life Go there right now and learn about Justin Wren and his incredible organization, Fight for the Forgotten, and how you can support and become a part of it. It's worth anything. It's worth everything to to struggle, to grit, to fight. We have to fight.